Okay, okay. Tip number four, please. Okay, and my next tip, carrying on with the theme of retrieval practice, is using technology for retrieval practice. So we've all had a lot of CPD with technology, with online learning. Um, people have different um, feelings about using technology, but I'm a big advocate for technology in the classroom with retrieval practice. Um, and I have three golden rules with technology. And the first one, it should be workload friendly to support the low effort, high impact. So I'll give you some examples of online tools that are workload friendly. Um, it also should be user friendly. Now this is probably the most important, user friendly for the teacher, for the student, so that you can use it regularly, it becomes automatic, doesn't take up that space in working memory. And then the third one is that it must be low stakes. And the reason I say this is because in my previous school, Key Stage 3 were online for over a year. And we did online exams. Now, I don't know how reliable they were at home, but we did them, formal exams, on Google Forms. And it was a combination of queued recall, free recall, multiple choice. They had a score, a percentage, a grade that went on a report to parents. And for Key Stage 3, it didn't get any more high stakes than that. And I remember when we returned back to the classroom and I did a Google Form quiz and panic set in. Miss, is this going on our report? Is it getting a grade? I said, no, you know about retrieval practice. But I then said to my colleagues, as a school, we're using Google Forms for summative assessment and it works great. Let's keep it like that. But there's so many other online quizzing tools. Let's not use Google Forms for retrieval practice. Let's have that clear distinction so that they, when they do a Google form, they know very clearly and they've been told this is an assessment. But then we can use Kahoot, Carousel, Quizlet, anything like that for retrieval practice. And they're all low stakes in their layout and their, the, the way they have the images and the music and the things like that. So as long as that's really clear for students as well. This is great. Well, well, today let's dive into some of the tech that you're, you're a fan of, Kate, because again, I'm always fascinated whether with my maths head on, this is something that works well in maths or not. So, so tell, tell me some of the ones that you use and why you like them. Quizzes. So quiz, com is amazing. And I'm really reluctant to write about online quizzing tools now because they keep developing and improving at a rapid pace. And quizzes and Kahoot have actually listened to me and taken on advice um, because it's grown so much. It was just multiple choice. Now there's queued recall. You can include an image. So like we said about the encoding cues, you can include images with questions. You can include equations. You can include audio, which is great for some students with learning difficulties or for languages. The fact that an audio clip can be inserted. There's also a teleport feature, which I love. So I type in the topic of a quiz that I want to quiz my students on, type in the French Revolution, all the public quizzes made by other teachers are available. But if I don't like some of their questions, then I don't have to, but I could think, oh, I'll take that and you teleport it to your quiz. And even then, once you've teleported it, you can edit it and amend it. So that's just a fantastic feature. And then when you set the quiz, you can personalise it to remove the music because that's very annoying and distracting. You can remove the leaderboards, which I do think teachers should do, especially in mixed ability classes or I'm not sure about in your classes, but it tends to be the same top three on the leaderboard. And it's just it shouldn't really be about that. It should be about them and their individual recall and also remove question timers. And that's really important for students with SEND and EAL, but perhaps other students as well. Because the minute that the, the clock is ticking, for some students, that makes it high stakes. Pressure, panic sets in. They form bad habits, such as not reading the question carefully. And we don't ever want them to rush. I also don't think it's fair, and I don't know if Kahoot still does this. I, I didn't use Kahoot for a long time because you couldn't remove the leaderboard feature. And you could only use the whole quiz, not bits, but they have changed. Um, but I didn't like on Kahoot that you could get more points for answering quickly. Why? When you've got two students that both got the right answer, should someone be a lot higher than the other student? Because we want them to take their time and get the answer correct. And so often when they're rushing, 
they go, I knew that, miss. I just didn't read the question. You know, I just... Because the clock is ticking. So the fact that you can personalise all these things on quizzes, um, you can also share the quiz with your colleagues. You can upload it straight to a Google Classroom. The results, um, it has a spreadsheet, which is just green and red. It's so easy. So you can just have a snapshot of the class. Oh, there's a lot of red for this question. Oh, everyone got this question right. It tells you your class percentage which is brilliant and really, really helpful. Um, and this links in with what Rosenshine said about the 80% success rate. Well, if you set a class quiz and it's 99%, your quiz is probably too easy. But if you then have looked and your percentage is 40%, it's probably too difficult. So there's all these things with quizzes that I can use to help me. I can create an effective quiz quickly I can set it easily, I can share it with colleagues and students, it will mark it for me and provide useful information for me moving forwards. And something else that teachers should do but they don't do enough is repeat quizzes. Don't just do the quiz and then do it once, do that quiz again. When you do the quiz again, it reduces the low stakes nature even further because you say we've already done this. You could add three or four more questions in from the content that you've done in between and then that is really where students should be seeing the progress and even if they say well we've done this miss <laughs> so, well we know how memory works or even if you get it right the second time your retrieval strength could st is still getting a boost so it's still a good opportunity so quizzes brilliant okay oh. few few questions few questions on this uh, so the first is where do you tend to use these, Kate? Is this, does this tend to be more in class with the kids on devices or is this homework as well? Yes, yeah, you can set it as homework, but I did work in a school where every student had access to technology. And this is another thing, obviously, that varies. Uh, for teachers who don't work in a high-tech environment, Plickers is, has been around a while, but it's still good. You just, one device needed, an iPad, a phone, you scan the class... And plickers, when they have these paper codes, they cannot cheat. It's not like a mini whiteboard where they can have a, a sneaky peek at someone's, at someone's answers plickers because the codes are unique and the way they have to hold up the code, it, it is impossible for them to cheat. They don't know what their other students uh, have answered. So, yeah, and I used that for a long time when I worked in a school without technology but then when I did work in a school with technology, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm really going to embrace that and trial uh, lots of these. I know you've had Adam Boxer on and Carousel Learn is great and they have a mini whiteboard mode. Um, so actually you don't need technology in class for that. You can have the questions up on the, on the whiteboard and the answer on the mini board. So there are ways uh, of, of doing this. Um, and there's also features, if you do set it as a homework, to try and stop cheating. <laughs> but it might block things or so on. Or, um, but yeah, I've used it mainly in lessons. Fantastic. Just a few more points on this. So we're going to go controversial now, Kate. So um, Dylan William often makes the point that... He, 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 when he uses diagnostic questions, often it'll just be kids voting with fingers, one for A, two for B, three for C, four for D, or A, B, C, D cards, because he doesn't like the idea that every answer a child ever gives is recorded somewhere. And on, on one of his arguments is this raises the stakes of the assessment, and also it maybe kind of causes some kids, like it knocks their confidence, they, they tend to kind of clam up instead of kind of being more open and honest. Well, what's, what's your view on that as a potential issue with technology for, for, for retrieval? You can use technology for no stakes retrieval practice to make it anonymous. Um, Mentimeter.com, students don't put their name in, they answer a question. And there's pros and cons to that because as a teacher, you see a snapshot of all the class responses, but you don't know who the individuals are. But if you are trying to do a no stakes approach, then that's great. That could be frustrating for the student. They've often gone, miss, that's my answer. They want the teacher to know. Um, I did a no stakes quiz on quizzes when my um, year seven class, I met them for the first time, probably because we'd been online and I did not want them to think this was a, a test or anything like that. So the first quiz I did with them, 
they had to have a quiz name that was a Harry Potter character. And actually, that was the only time I've ever kept the leaderboard up because we was like Dumbledore, Hagrid. And it was really fun. And it was anonymous because I didn't know who Dumbledore was. And that's not something I would do regularly. But they're still going through the act and process of recall and retrieval practice. Even though I couldn't see the individuals with their real names, I could still see who scored correctly and incorrectly on what questions. So it still was useful for me. So we can use technology anonymously. or We could use something like Padlet and Jamboard. They're like digital <clears throat> post-it notes as well. Um, but I do think, again, it is really difficult, the low stakes nature of it, because Mentimeter, thankfully, has a profanity filter. Because if you were to say to students, I don't know who wrote what, they could think, oh, right, miss has just give us a green light. And, and actually, that has worried me. What if a student did just write something? They never have. They never have. Um, but what if they did write something really, really bad? And I wouldn't be able to know who wrote that. So <laughs> it's just about sort of the pros and cons and the variety. But the more that you do retrieval practice anyway, the, the more it just normalises it as a classroom routine. Amazing. One, one more thing on this, uh, Kate. I'm interested in using technology for self-quizzing because we know from research, whether it's the Dunlosky paper or whatever, that, that self-quizzing is a really good way for, for kids to remember and we're promoting good study habits and so on. Do you, do, do you find any of these technologies lend them particularly well to kids revising independently at home? And, and if so, which ones? Yeah, so digital flashcards are great for this. And a question that I'm really interested in, and I've asked Daisy Christodoulo and I've asked other people, is about should students create their own flashcards or use yeah. pre-made flashcards? Now, obviously, the benefit of them creating them themselves is they're thinking hard about the questions, and this that's a good strategy in itself. But, as we know, question design is difficult. Mm -hmm. And if students are going to create flashcards... They need to be taught how they need examples, modeling, scaffold it, all these things. Was if we, our sole purpose is retrieval practice, then actually it could just be better to use ready-made flashcards that are specific to an exam board and a topic and so on. And there's Quizlet, there's Anki. Anki has millions. And, and Quizlet and Anki, just as two, and also Quizzes has flashcards. They have the options where you can create your own or select ones that are already made. Now, these are great because actually, if you think about a GCSE, how many subjects students have to have, and imagine all those physical copies of flashcards, even though I am a bit old school and I prefer, <laughs> if I was revising, I would have paper flashcard. But let's just think practically, a student always has their phone on them was not going to carry around these flashcards packs around with them. But they could be travelling somewhere, they could be waiting, and they could just get out their phone and use the flashcards. And Anki, although I don't know how this works, because it's the tech, has, um, when a student answers a question and they put whether it was correct or not, it records that and it has an algorithm so that it knows next time which questions to focus on. The problem with most online flashcards, though, and actually paper flashcards, is that students don't always do the act of retrieval. You have to write it or say it. So, and that's a problem with the digital flashcards. And that could be a little bit embarrassing if you're, you're not going to say it out loud um, if you're on your own or if you're on the bus or something. But what ideally students should do is probably read the question, write the answer, then look for the answer and put a tick or a cross. But they don't, they just read the question, think, flip it over. And they haven't done that. They haven't done that physical act of retrieval practice. So flashcards can be brilliant, but they can be bad. If they're just copied out, rereading, if they're not doing retrieval practice. But digital flashcards, my students have really liked them. 
Fantastic. I've just thought of one more question, Kate. Again, you say too much good stuff here, so I'm going to have to just throw this in. There's a risk this will open up a whole can of worms, so feel free to swerve this one. But let's say a student is revising. They've made themselves a, a set of flashcards, digital flashcards or physical ones for history, geography, English and so on. Now, what's the research say here about, say they've got half an hour to revise, should they do half an hour and spend that half an hour in geography and then the next day half an hour in history and then the next day half an hour in English? Or should it be half an hour where any card from any subject can come up and it's, it's a mixed bag? Because I'm really torn on this. Yeah. My, my own understanding of, of interleaving is that it's a good idea to mix things up. But also I understand the idea of kind of thinking deeply and having a coherent kind of chain of thought about a subject and, and tying together ideas. So and any thoughts on that? Should we mix it up or, or keep it subject focused? I can answer that because I asked John Dunlosky the exact same question. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Let's go. <laughs> and he is just amazing, Professor. Anyone who's not aware, strengthening the student toolbox. So I, I asked him that same question as well because... I have seen students take it to the extreme where they've just mashed up all their flashcards. Now, they do need to reshuffle and reorder them. We don't want them to just learn it answer by answer by answer. But actually, across different subjects, Dunlosky was quite clear and said, no, I don't think that's a good idea. He said, of, of course, the idea of interleaving um, and doing half an hour one night of one subject, and then all why not have 15 minutes of geography, 15 minutes of history, and then another day have 15 minutes of history, history. That, that type of thing. So there are ways that we can interleave. But yeah, I'm really interested in flashcards. And I think we haven't quite fully got there with really embracing them. Because if we're asking students to create their own, they need to be creating them from the start of the year. Because otherwise it's a huge workload issue just before the exams, making them. And if they are using them online, we need to quality assure and check that they they are correct. But that question, yeah, I put it to Dunlosky because interleaving in terms of cognitive science, I teach history and I have a very different approach to interleaving than you in maths because my curriculum is driven with chronology. So it just would not make sense to teach a lesson about 1930s Germany, 1960s Germany, and then keep going back and two. So I don't have that same level of expertise, but John Dunlosky was really confident when he said, no, don't think that's a good idea. Keep the flashcards and sessions subject and topic based. Amazing. I love nothing more than a clear, definitive answer, Kate. That's fantastic.